Hello everyone and welcome to the third episode of the Harvington Hall podcast. Thank you all once again for tuning into our podcast. Today we're going to be talking to Dr Owen Emerson. He's a historian based down at the wonderful Hever Castle in Kent. Now I'm sure for any Tudor enthusiast out there, it really has to be in your top five Tudor places to visit. Now I visited back in 2016 and I have to say it was a very memorable day. Um, You just get soaked up with its atmosphere and its history. It really is a fascinating place. Now, of course, it's known as the childhood home of Anne Boleyn. So, of course, Anne Boleyn is going to feature heavily in this podcast. But we are also going to discuss Heaver's other occupants. And surprisingly, well, you may be surprised to learn that Heaver and Harvington do have some similarities. But we'll get onto that very shortly. Now, Owen is currently writing a book on Heaver Castle with the lovely Claire Ridgeway, who runs the Tudor Society. It's going to be called Heaver, a castle and its people. And he tells me that it's going to be out sometime next year. Now today, this is going to be nice and relaxed for me because Owen and I have actually got to know each other pretty well over social media in the last 12 months. So it's not like I'm going in there blind, talking to someone who I've read all their books and then uh, just sort of thrown in front of and have to ask some questions. So uh, nice and relaxed today. I'm going to looking forward to this one. So Owen, thank you so much for joining us on the Harmington podcast. How are you, mate? You all right? I'm very good, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's an absolute pleasure. Owen, I've given you a little bit of an introduction, but for those of you who don't know who you are, would you just like to introduce yourself? Yeah, absolutely. I'm a social and cultural historian. Uh, I graduated from the University of Sussex, and I work at the wonderful Hever Castle, the childhood home of Anne Boleyn. Lovely, thank you. So, Owen, we can't discuss Hever without talking about Anne Boleyn. I mean, when you look at social media, Anne Boleyn pretty much is most people's favourite uh, queen of Henry VIII or wife of Henry VIII. Um, there's a lot of information out there on Anne, some of it not all true. Um, there's a lot of sort of debates with a lot of things with Anne. Um, but what do we know about her upbringing? Sure. Well, for someone as well studied as Anne Boleyn, we actually know very little about her early life. Um, we know that she's probably born in Norfolk at the family seat of Blickling Manor to Thomas Boleyn and Elizabeth Howard, and that she had four siblings and that her birth was sometime around 1501 to 1507. There's a lot of controversy over that, and we'll come back to that shortly. We know that in around, around 1505, Thomas Boleyn inherits all of his father's properties, and because of his flourishing career at court, it's likely at this time that Thomas moves to Hever Castle in Kent. And at some point, her brothers, Thomas and Henry, die whilst in Kent. Uh, the former is buried at Penshurst Place, and the latter is at Hever. And I think it's probable that Thomas was the elder of the sons and uh, he took his father's name, for example, and that he had perhaps been boarded out for educational purposes to Penshurst, where the Duke of Buckingham's heir, that's Henry Stafford, may have been educated. He was born around 1501. So getting back to Anne's birth date, I personally believe that it's more likely she was born around the earlier of those two dates, so 1501. And I believe that the letter she wrote to her father in 1514 from the court of Margaret of Austria gives us an indication of both when she's born and what kind of education has been afforded to her. So um, Margaret of Austria uh, is in the Low Countries, that's where Anne uh, starts out her education abroad. And she gets that place because Thomas Boleyn has a a career as a diplomat and because of his aptitude in that job he secures very coveted places for his daughters abroad and this move is very much part of furthering their education but I do have to question whether a seven-year-old would have acquired the motor skills that are demonstrated in that letter in French and um Although there are mistakes, and that's something Anne excuses herself for in the letter, I just don't 
think it, it's quite possible that a six-year-old could have penned it. So I go more for the 1501 date. Um, but of course, education in this period, in the early modern period, was far more intense than today. And perhaps those giving it had far more expectations of children. And we can see comparatively extraordinary advancement in the skills acquired by children, particularly Henry's, and perhaps none more so than Anne's Elizabeth. Um, so whether or not she was six or 13, I think we can say that she had a very good education before going abroad to finish that education. So we know that Anne is a really accomplished musician. Uh, she plays several instruments, she can sing and dance, and she's a patron of the arts. And she obviously has a real fondness for truly beautifully illuminated manuscripts, which we'll touch upon later. Um, we know that she's a keen theologian, she immerses herself in the current religious debates. And, the, and we know that Anne's brother George shares and excels in many of these interests. So I think we can assume that there is a familial engendering of these attributes before Anne is sent away to finish her education abroad, where these interests are undoubtedly broadened. And indeed her father, who secures this specific place for her, is a similarly cultured man. And he cho chooses these uh, positions specifically for her. They're, they're a product of his uh, connections, essentially. Fascinating stuff there. So, I mean, how much do you think Anne, or how much exposure did Anne have to these new radical beliefs? Again, I believe that as well as her broader education, Anne's theological exploration begins with her family. Thomas was obviously inspired by um, both intellectual and religious debate and would ultimately prove a supporter of reform. And I think uh, Dr. Lauren McKay best describes this reformist zeal by concluding that his faith is a mixture of the old and the new, both being a product of the older religious settlement and an actor in the new one. So it's within this hub of theological discussion and debate that Anne grows up both at home and abroad. So Thomas was sent to the court of Margaret Austria in the Low Countries in 1512 to conclude uh, an alliance between England and Margaret's father, the Holy Roman Emperor Maximilian I, uh, and that's an alliance against France. And Thomas and Margaret really seem to have hit it off during this period, and, and it's this which opens up that opportunity for Anne in 1513. And we also have evidence that Thomas is actually using these diplomatic missions to bring back works that were considered heretical in England. So he's obviously someone of committed and courageous faith. Now, Margaret's court was a hub of renowned culture, a sort of center of Renaissance ethos. And this is where Anne would have begun to fine tune her skills in music, dance, but most importantly in courtly love, which is really sort of the, cult, uh, the cultural pulse of the court as it were. Um, this highly conventionalized language of flattery and love that derives from the medieval traditions and that permeates in quite a performative way into the Renaissance tradition. And of course, this is where Anne begins to speak more fluently in French, something that stands her in good stead when she transfers to France a year later. So again, there's a cloud of mystery. We don't know exactly when Anne arrived at the French court, although Thomas requested for her to be released in 1514. And our first mention of Anne actually in France is the next year. So it is possible that she served Henry's sister, Mary Rose, but she's chiefly a member of Queen Claude's household, who is the wife of Francis I. Now, contrary to what you see in popular culture, while Claude's household is cultured, it was also a very pious and virtuous one. And Claude maintained a really quite strict code of conduct for her ladies. Uh, it was also very much a Renaissance court. And it's also almost certainly here that Anne's spiritual education flourishes. We know that Anne is a close confidant of Queen Claude's sister, Renee, who is a close correspondent with many Protestant uh, Protestants or evangelicals as they would have been known then 
and who herself would later be arrested, although not punished for her own heretical beliefs. Uh, we also believe Anne may have had a connection to Marguerite de Angoulême at this time, who's a champion of reformist ideals. We don't have any uh, evidence of quite how Marguerite influenced Anne at this time, but we know from later correspondence during Anne's reign that they did have a close connection. So Anne has grown up with these incredibly influential women who are able to explore and receive often radical religious realizations. And I think it's within this context that Anne's already broad-minded feet, thanks to her family's reformist influences, are crossing the threshold of reformist ideas. Okay, so how do you think Anne influenced Henry in terms of religion? Um, so I think Claire Ridgway best sums up Anne's faith when she describes Anne as being a non-schismatic reformist. So Anne is heavily influenced by French humanist individuals such as Jacques Lefebvre, whereby reform meant returning to the scripture and reforming the church from within, getting back to the words of Christ and reforming the church without separating from it. Um, so I don't think we have much evidence at all to, to, to suggest that Anne was on a mission to encourage a schism, a break with Rome. But I do think we can conclude that Anne influenced Henry towards previously banned materials such as the works of William Tyndale. Now, we're often told that Anne introduced Henry to Tyndale's obedience of the Christian man. And while she does, it's not really something she does off her own back. Rather, she makes a clever manoeuvre out of a really bad situation. So Anne actually lends her copy to one of her women, whose suitor then borrows the text, and from whom it is confiscated and ends up in Wolsey's hands. So possessing one of these texts at that time is completely banned, and you know people burn for this kind of stuff. So Anne is very quick, and she introduces Henry to the text to assuage his concerns about it. But Anne is really clever because in doing so, she introduces him to Tyndale's insistence that kings are accountable only to God and not to the Pope. So Anne's sort of really playing a blinder here. She's turning a potentially dangerous situation into one that will significantly aid Henry's plight in trying to resolve his great matter. Uh, you know, from the Pope refusing to annul his marriage. So Henry reportedly stated that this book is for me and all kings to read. So I think Anne's really showing her mettle here. She's a shrewd political mover. Henry would, of course, go on to break with Rome and make himself, uh, you know, supreme head of the church to, to marry Anne. But Henry remains what we would view as traditionally Catholic. But we can see that Anne is patronising reformists during her reign, such as Matthew Parker and Thomas Cranmer. She also intervenes in the plight of those facing the heresy laws, such as the Prior of Reading, who is in possession of texts deemed heretical, and similarly Nicholas Bourbon. She champions, for example, the vernacular translation of biblical texts. She distributes a book of Psalms in English to members of her own household, and she even displays a copy of Tyndale's translation of the New Testament in her apartments. We know that some, to some degree there's a dispute between Anne and Thomas Cromwell regarding the direction of the dis dissolution of the monasteries towards the end of her reign. And although this is chiefly only cited to demonstrate either a new or, as I believe, an ongoing rift between Anne and Cromwell, I think it also tells us something about Anne's faith and how her faith shaped how important she believed education was, both on a spiritual and temporal level. So I think there are a number of ways in which she influences Henry, but ultimately Henry remains this staunchly Catholic monarch. Okay, interesting. So um, with all that in mind, what, I mean, what remaining sources are there that tell us about Anne's religious beliefs? So there are many surviving items that tell us about Anne's faith, and, and many of them are books. So, for example, at Heaver, we have two remarkable books that were both owned by Anne, her books of hours. She's both signed and inscribed these. Uh, 
Uh, they're absolute treasures. I love them. Um, the first one was created in Bruges between 1410 and 1450. And the second one's created much later in 1528 in Paris and is most likely created specifically for Anne. And I think they tell us very much about Anne's piety, her commitment to faith, but also they tell us a little, about, a little bit about Anne herself. Her, her words are a direct link to the lady herself here. So in the earlier text, she's written uh, Le Temps Viendre, Je Anne Boleyn, or The Time Will Come. And it's written next to an illumination of the second coming and the last judgment, which makes us question here if Anne is referring to her own mortality, perhaps. Or maybe she's even talking about the time when she's able to secure the legacy that she's promised to Henry. In the later book, she's written, Remember me when you do pray that hope doth lead from day to day, next to a woodcut of the presentation in the temple. So again, there may well be a reference here to Anne's hopes and desires in terms of that succession. I think it's also really important to note that it's very possible that these books shifted in meaning for Anne. Remember that Anne was something of an evangelical, and these devotional books became far less popular after the Reformation. So as Anne something of a catalyst in the Henrican Reformation, it's, it's important to note that her faith was challenged and shifted, and so too may her understanding of these books. Of course, Anne's reformist zeal has its limits. So for example, we know she does not eschew the doctrine of transubstantiation, but these books have been defaced. So prayers for certain saints like Thomas Beckett are crossed out. And these alterations really reflect that shift. Now, it's really hard to say if they're made by Anne, but they do tell us something of the plasticity of how these texts were read over time. We do also have surviving texts that George Boleyn translated for his sister. And I'd really recommend the study of George Boleyn by Claire Ridgway and Claire Cherry. Um, they conclude that Anne is really a partner in crime when it came to religion with George, and they sort of bounce ideas off of each other. And they appear not to only have just a, a really close relationship of siblings, but also in terms of theology. So one of these translations is a, a, based on the works of the aforementioned Jacques Lefeuve, and you can visit that in the British Library today. And they also hold an, another book of hours in the British Library that belonged to Anne, and both Henry and Anne have written in that. So I think we can also very clearly see Anne's faith at play during her downfall, many of the documents of which are held at the National Archives. And we know that just before her downfall, she entrusts her daughter's spiritual welfare, welfare to Matthew Parker, who, of course, will go on to become Elizabeth Archbishop of Canterbury. We see Anne also using her last confession in a very particular way and in a very public way, asking that the constable of the tower is present to witness her protestation of innocence before God. So, yes, there are many surviving texts and they really do help us to explore her faith in numerous ways. Excellent. Thanks, Owen. Um, I've got to say, I mean, I've studied the Tudor period for well, for years, over 20 years now. And Anne Boleyn is someone I haven't studied half as much as I should have done. And I'm sure people listening now are learning stuff about Anne uh, whilst we're talking about it. But um, something I want to know is, I mean, what were the limitations of Anne's reformism? So, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Anne doesn't eschew the doctrine of transubstantiation. And she continues to adhere to many of the traditionally Catholic practices that were required during her reign. So we know she also refused a translation of a text when presented to her by Tristan Revelle in 1536, which questioned the doctrine of the mass. So another limitation there. And indeed, I would argue that to the modern eye, we'd very much see Anne as a practicing Catholic. However, when historians try and define Anne as either an evangelical radical or a traditional Catholic, we sort of miss the subtle nuances of Anne's own faith that tell us about her beliefs at a time when such reformist ideas in England are, are in their infancy. So she certainly wasn't more Lutheran than Luther, as Shapwee claimed, uh, but she was certainly more evangelical than Henry is. 
Lovely. Thank you for that. Um, Owen, so final question to you now really is in what impact did Anne's influence have on those who went on to live at Hever? I think we can see that the great schism that for a time Anne was at the centre of has a real lasting impact uh, on the future residents of Hever. And I think that's really evident during both the tenure of Anne of Cleves, who of course is Henry's discarded fourth wife, and also after her death um, with the Wardergrave family who purchased the property from the crown after Anne died. So Henry VIII may have remained a sort of traditional Catholic, but his three children certainly do not follow suit. And ever the pragmatist, Anne of Cleves is really adaptable in those winds of reform and counter-reform that sweep through the country as Henry's children attempt to reshape the church. So when Mary succeeds to the throne, she reverses the institutionally Protestant changes that Edward VI implements. And Anne of Cleves' life is actually really imperiled because of the company she keeps and also because she lives at Hever. So we have references to Anne being at Hever when she writes to Mary on the occasion of her marriage to Philip of Spain. And that marriage really is a, a very controversial marriage at the time. And Anne's location at Hever during the rebellion that ensues because of that marriage places her in really serious danger. So that rebellion is known as, of course, as the White Rebellion in 1554, and it's chiefly a rebellion against Mary and Philip of Spain. And it's probably more uh, or as much to do with politics as it is religion. Um, Sir so Thomas Wyatt the Younger is the leader of that rebellion and he is based at Allington Castle in Kent which is only 15 miles away from Anne is located at Hever and Allington's really the hub of that rebellion. Now before the rebellion takes place um, his involvement of Edward Courtney who's the Queen's second cousin really sort of gives Mary the upper hand because he then confesses to Stephen Gardner just before the rebellion, giving the crown the upper hand. So Mary really sort of shows her mettle in a speech she gives at the Capitol, at the Guildhall, and really shows that she's able to command the loyalty of her subjects. And it's a really decisive moment that really is sort of the downfall of the Wyatt Rebellion thereafter. It goes downhill quite rapidly. Mary holds her ground, she refuses to leave court, and ev eventually Sir Thomas Wyatt is captured. Now Anne, for some reason, is very quickly implicated in the Wyatt Rebellion, and she's accused, amongst other things, of being a confidant of the Princess Elizabeth, and uh, of involving her brother in Cleves in this plot. And we can see that Anne's in a really dangerous position. Because of that closeness to Elizabeth, because of her continued correspondence with her brother and her proximity to Wyatt in Allington. She's also a really close confidant of Sir Thomas Carden, who had been allowed to purchase Bletchingley Palace, which Anne also previously owned. And he was implicated in the rebellion. So things look incredibly precarious for Anne during this tumultuous period. Uh, when Mary is bringing England back to Rome. Now, no proof is ever found that Cardin or Elizabeth were involved, and therefore suspicion of Anne's involvement abates. However, Anne never really regains the trust or good relationship that, pre that she previously had with Mary. And it's really quite a sad end, for, end of the, the life of Anne, who's been alienated from Mary through no real fault of her own. So with Anne's death and with Heaver vacant, Mary then sells the property to Edward Waldegrave, who is a recusant Catholic. Now, she, he had been in the employ of Mary during Edward's reign. And uh, Edward, of course, banned the hearing of mass in Mary's household at Copt Hill in Essex. And he'd been imprisoned in the tower for not adhering to this. Uh, Mary uh, releases him from the tower when Edward dies and she ascends to the throne. Now, during this counter-reformation, Edward Wardegrave flourishes 
Uh, he is knighted and Mary even places him on her Privy Council. So, of course, Mary is probably best remembered for her purges of Protestants throughout her reign when 300 religious dissenters are burned at the stake, known as the Marian Persecutions. And like that of her brother before her, her reign is short, she's unable to provide an heir, and her successor is Anne Boleyn's daughter, Elizabeth I. Now, I would argue she's just as culpable of religious intolerance, killing nearly 200 Catholics during her reign. But history, of course, is written by the victors, and we have the Book of Martyrs by John Fox to thank for this uh, imbalance in how we view these two queens, in my opinion. Uh, that, of course, is a, a bestseller in 1536, which documents all of Mary's persecutions and helps to differentiate you know, the Bloody Mary from, from Good Queen Bess. Um, and of course, as your Harvington Hall listeners will know well, during Elizabeth's reign, Catholics had to grow adept at con concealment, creating spaces like in your lovely property where they could hide their priest uh, should the authorities come looking. And it's quite possible that we have a couple of these spaces at Hever uh, that were created during Walder Graves' tenure. Of course, Celebrating Mass has been made illegal by the Act of Uniformity in 1559 and Elizabeth punished those who trained or harboured priests as traitors and not as heretics. So those who fall foul of the law face not the flames but potentially the full horror of the traitor's death, hanging, drawing and quartering. Um, and Sir Edward Waldegrave of Hever, his short respite from persecution is shattered in 1561 when he's arrested in conjunction with a really rather spurious conspiracy known as the Waldegrave Conspiracy. And this comes about because customs officials at Gravesend had seized Waldegrave's priest, uh, and that's Father John Cox. He's found with rosary and letters for Catholic exiles. And after an interrogation, perhaps under torture, Sir Edward Waldegrave is named as one of many for whom Cox has said mass. Now, Edward Waldegrave is arrested with 22 other lay Catholics who are implicated by that confession. And they're all found guilty before the Essex Assize Court in, uh, on the 3rd of June, 1561. Now, the lay Catholics are ordered to pay a fine of 100 marks. Now, that's not shy of £15,000 in today's money. It's an enormous sum. And this, Edward uh, Waldegrave refuses to pay, and therefore he and his wife are taken duly back to the Tower of London. And very sadly for the Waldegraves, he doesn't last long there. He dies in his cell on the 1st of September, 1561. He's the third occupant of Hever to die in the Tower of London. His wife, Frances, is released from the tower after his death, but she also refuses to pay a fine. Uh, it's obviously something that they feel very strongly about, and therefore they forfeit Edward's manor of Newhall in Essex in lieu of that payment. Now, I said it was a spurious conspiracy, and that's because it um, appears to have just been the master, uh, masterminded by uh, William Cecil, who's the Queen's chief advisor. And he was really determined for, uh, for Elizabeth to not marry Robert Dudley. He feared that although a Protestant, Dudley would seek the support for his marriage to the Queen from, the, from King Philip of Spain and risk certain conditions laid down on Philip's part that would return England to Catholicism. So rumours that those accused were the Waldegraves were conspiring to kill the Queen as well. And that sort of creates a, a sufficient furore uh, of a Catholic conspiracy to ensure that any marriage plans that Dudley had are duly thwarted. So it's perhaps in this context of this being really rather far-fetched that the priests accused were actually only corporally, pu corporally punished, uh, being pilloried twice and then imprisoned, so they're not actually subject to the full horror of capital punishment. Um, it actually appears that the Waldegraves spend little time at Hever Castle for the rest of their nearly 150 years of ownership. They choose to rent it out for income instead. And it's probably for that reason that we have so much of the Boleyn's family home intact. And indeed, the subsequent owners, uh, the Humphreys, the Waldos, and then the Mead Waldos, 
all of them uh, appear to have rented Heva out. Um, so it's probably for those reasons that we have these uh, vestiges of what appear to be priest holes as well uh, in situ. They really are a physical manifestation of those seismic shifts that occur because of Anne Boleyn, the woman that who lived there. You know, they they are markers of the changes that happen to the families that subsequently own it because of that sch that schism that ensued in the aftermath of Henry's break with Rome. Thank you very much, Owen. I'm sure everyone listening will agree. Uh, fascinating. You clearly know Anne Boleyn and the occupants of Hever Castle. And I, what I really love there is, of course, as I've said, that there's a link between Harvington and, and Hever where you've potentially got a priest hide. Um, which I think is absolutely great. You know, he was owned by a recusant. Harvington was also during that time. So we've come to this point of the podcast where we ask you a couple of questions. And again, just like the last podcast, uh, young Tilly is asked a question and she wants to know, Owen, what is your favourite thing about working at Hever Castle? Gosh, that's a really good question. Um, I love lots of aspects of it. Um, but I think my favourite part is locking the castle up at night and I get about half an hour uh, of the castle to myself and it's it's really atmospheric at that time of the evening and after a busy day sort of all the floorboards start creaking back into place having uh, done a good day's work so I quite like scaring myself a bit as well I think that's my favourite part. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, the other question is, she wants to know, how did you get into history and how did you become a historian? That's a really good question. So I've always been interested in history. Um, when I was about four years old, I saw a Tudor film, Anne of the Thousand Days, on television with my mum. And that's when I fell in love with Hever and I went to Hever um, to explore it for my fifth birthday, I believe and um, always loved history at school, but I wasn't particularly good at it. I have to say, I didn't get the best marks, and I actually failed my history A-level. Um, so this is for all of the people out there who don't do particularly well um, in early education. It's never too late. So I um, didn't go to university until I was about 25, and I did so on the condition of writing an essay. And um, yeah, I did all three degrees, my undergraduate, my master's and my PhD at Sussex University. And yeah, I, I hope that's a bit of encouragement for those of you who love history, but don't quite get on with how it's taught at earlier levels. Uh, because there's a big difference between how history is taught at school and in college and how history is taught at university. Um, there's a much more original thinking at university and um, it's perhaps a bit more prescriptive at, um, at school level. Um, so yeah, hopefully um, if any of you are interested in getting involved in history, um, that's the route I took. But you know, there, there are other really great historians out there who didn't go to university at all they just love the subject and immerse themselves in it, find original sources and read a lot about the subject that they love and just go for it. Um, so th there's no right or wrong way of getting into history. Um, I've done it sort of the more academic way, although uh, via a long route. And um, but it, you know, it's just as, as valid to present your history, for example, in videos, uh, through podcasts. Um, I think any, any avenue is valid. And what's most important is if, you know, you get something out of it and you love it. Um, that's, that's what I would say. Thank you, Owen. I think that is a perfect bit of advice there for any aspiring historians out there. Uh, just like young Tilly. So Owen, thank you so much for being part of the podcast. I look forward to showing you around Harvington one day and uh, yeah, I'll see you very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed for having me. It's uh, been an absolute pleasure. <laughs>
So there you have it. That was Dr. Owen Emerson of Hever Castle. And remember, guys, please look out for his book that he's co-authoring with Claire Ridgeway next year. Don't forget to follow us on social media. We are on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. And one thing you'll probably notice, we have been posting about our restoration or our conservation project that is um, going to be ongoing. The heritage sector has been hit extremely hard with COVID recently. So it's down to you guys really and your donations to help buildings like Harmonton Hall to keep going for future generations. So if you wanted to donate, please go to our website, harventonhall.co.uk, hit the donate button. And trust me when I say any donation is hugely, hugely appreciated. So until next time, everybody, stay safe and we will see you very soon.